Hi, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy, and this week's live streaming video is going to be about ISO 13, I'm sorry, ISO 14971. The ISO 14971 standard is a medical device standard for risk management. A lot of company aren't a lot of companies aren't familiar with um, all the standards, and it's hard to keep track of them all because they change, particularly the revision of the standards, but it's a 10-part standard. If you go into type in Wikipedia, I think it still says it's a nine-part standard, which means it's only um, like a couple years out of date. Um, what happened is in 2019, they changed the standard, they updated it, and one of the things they did is made it follow the same format in terms of content and sections as all the other ISO standards. So what was missing from the previous version, which was in 2007, was a section for normative references. So these are references to other standards um, that, that would be apply, applicable to this particular standard. So that was the only thing that really changed in terms of numbering, but it affected all the other sections. So instead of having a nine section standard, now we have a 10 section standard. So what was before section three is now section four. What was before section two is now section three. Um, and now we have 10 sections, but the overall standard, when they changed it in 2017, they said, don't change the process. Um, clarify things, improve things, make it a little bit more clear, but don't cha fundamentally change the process because it's embedded throughout all the other standards that we use for medical devices. Number one, 1345, it references 14971 in section 7.1. You see all the electrical safety standards, um, IEC 6601, 6601-1-2. Um, all those electrical safety and EMC testing standards include um, 14971 as the risk management standard. You also see it in software standards. So there's an ISO, um, sorry, um, IEC 8001-1. That particular standard is for the application of risk management or 14971 to software. So in embedded systems and firmware. If you had, um, if you're looking for a standard to help you, how do we document our risk management? How do we identify what risks are? How do we come up with risk controls? All those concepts are what's in 14971. And it's not optional, it's required for CE marking. It's what the FDA expects you to comply with for uh, any devices that are going to be 510K cleared or they're going to get a de novo or a PMA. Um, they expect these, uh, the FDA expects you to follow 14971 as well. Health Canada expects it. It's a global standard that we use for risk management devices. But I still really haven't explained what risk management is. So all you're trying to do with risk management is trying to reduce the potential for harm. That's the basic fundamental. What is the probability of harm to somebody and what is the severity of that harm? You multiply those two things together and you get risk. That's the definition of risk. The probability of harm and the severity of harm. And they usually do it in reverse order. So severity of harm first, probability of harm. It doesn't matter. You're just multiplying the two together to calculate what risk is. But the risk management process is the way we go about dropping that risk, reducing that risk that we see. So how do we do that? Well, um, number one, you start out the process with a risk management plan. Just like you would in design, you'd have a design plan. When you have a risk management plan, what you're supposed to be doing is figuring out how can I reduce um, this? But I, I first have to figure out what the hazards are. What can, what can hurt me? So the first step of your risk management process is to come up with hazards, a list of them. What are all the things that can cause harm to somebody? They call that hazard identification. That's the first thing that should be in your plan. The second thing you should be doing is estimating what those risks are. So every single hazard you identify, you would say, well, what is the severity of, of the harm that could occur from this hazard? 
and what is the probability of occurrence of harm for this particular hazard. The third thing that you would do after you've estimated those, you would say, okay, now that I know what the potential risks are here and I've estimated those, now I need to decide whether these are going to be um, acceptable risks. So um, we, we do risk evaluation. Is, is this an acceptable risk or not? In order to do that, you have to have, to have a risk management policy. Now, that's not what your procedure is. You have a separate document that's called a risk management policy and determines how you decide whether risk is acceptable or not. And they clarified that in the new 24971 guidance document. So it's IEC TR, or sorry, ISO TR um, 24971 2020. And it's in, um, I believe, I think it's in Annex C. Yes, uh, Annex C of that guidance document. It talks about what, where, how you write a risk management policy and how you use that to decide whether risks are acceptable or not. The next step, so, so far we, we had our risk management plan, then we had our hazard identification, then we had our risk estimation, then we had risk evaluation. Now we're going to identify risk controls, controls that reduce the risk. So a risk control is anything that we can do by design of a medical device, manufacturer of a medical device, adding protective measures such as alarms, or providing information to the user about these risks, so a warning to them in the labeling the product or in the instructions. Any of those things would be considered something that, um, that we can use as a risk control to reduce the possibility or the severity of somebody getting hurt by the product, the harm. So those are risk controls. After we um, have made a list of potential risk controls, and we always want to do it in a specific order, design and manufacture first, protective measures second, and warnings and labelings last, because that's the order of effectiveness. Then we have to decide which one we're going to implement. Once we've decided this is the one we're going to implement, we call that process of deciding which risk controls to implement a risk control option analysis, then we decide, is the overall residual risk acceptable? So you've already done an acceptance of individual risks. We've got risk controls we've implemented. Now we want to look at the overall residual risk. Is that acceptable? And finally, we're going to do a benefit risk analysis. Now, this is one, where, one place where we see a difference between the standard and what we see in certain countries. In Europe, you're required to do a risk a benefit risk analysis no matter what for every single risk and the overall residual risk. But in the U.S. and in the international standard in Canada, they don't require that you do a benefit risk analysis for all risks. They only require that you do a benefit risk analysis when you identify a risk doesn't meet your risk acceptability uh, policy. So, for instance, if you're developing something that is a high risk device, such as um, a defibrillator. This device could hurt somebody and it might not have an acceptable risk uh, according to your policy. However, the risk of dying um, if your heart stops is very severe and probable. So the benefits of using this defibrillator versus the risks of using the device, the benefits outweigh the risks. So therefore we allow you to launch that product in the, in whatever country is considering it. So that's what a benefit risk analysis is. At the very end of the process, after we've done all those steps, you have a review of your risk management. Um, you're looking at two things. Number one, have we done all the things that we're in our plan? That's the first step. The second kind of risk review is to review your overall risk manager process to see if your risk manager process is effective. So are we conducting risk management reviews when we're supposed to? Are we following all our procedures? Are we reducing risk? Is there anything we're forgetting to do? These are the kinds of things you do in a risk manager process review. But when you're doing a risk review of an individual product or product family, you're looking for, did we follow the risk management plan for that product or product family? Once you've done your risk manager review, there's still one more step. And that's to decide, 
how you're going to monitor your process, your risk management process in your product to make sure that risk controls are effective. In some things you can't um, assess truly whether they're effective or not until after the product's been on the market for a while. For example, one of the most common ones would be human factors. If you have risk controls in place to make the device easier to understand, you use training to help people understand how to use the device. You have um, instruction for use. Um, maybe you have color coding. Maybe you have special features on it that make it impossible to misuse the device to make a use error. Those are all human factors risk controls that you're gonna implement for your device and you want to make sure those are effective. The, what you have to do is go out there and actually survey users and watch users of your device and make sure they aren't making those mistakes. You can't really assess that when you're only working with a small number of users and a prototype device. You really need to see what happens when you put it in the hands of thousands of people or at least hundreds of people and in different cultures, different hospitals, different um, countries, different languages, those risk controls might not work. For instance, a light switch that goes up might be on in one country, and a light switch that goes up might be off in another country. So just depending on what your cultural bias is, that can affect the usability of a device. So the effectiveness of your risk controls for human factors should be absolutely top of your list for something you check in your post-market plan. They call these post-market um, activities that you're going to perform or post-market surveillance. You go out there and you see, are people making mistakes when they use our device? Are the risk controls and training we put in place, are they working or not? Another thing that you could think of that would be a post-market activity that you would gather information on is, in terms of effectiveness of risk controls would be cybersecurity. You, you have the potential for somebody hacking into your device or you or could manipulate the data, could prevent communications, data could be mixed up, all kinds of bad things could happen from a cybersecurity standpoint. So you're going to put risk controls in place to prevent um, any problems with the security of your software and your data. Well, how effective are those risk controls today? How Good are they next year and the year after and the year after? Every year, hackers find a new way around risk controls that you put in place, security measures. So you're going to have to go back and check on a regular basis what is the way that people are going to do, um, what is the way that people will find vulnerabilities, what are the latest vulnerabilities that have been reported for an operating system that you might be using or code that you're writing, particularly if it's open source code. You want to subscribe to databases that report those vulnerabilities and look at how you can improve your risk controls that you've already put in place. You might need patches. You might need updates. You might need, even need to recall product if it's truly unsafe and it creates a hazardous situation for your customers. Now, the software doesn't jump out and grab you and hurt you, but it creates a hazardous situation where if the software isn't working properly, there could be harm caused by something else because software isn't working. So that's an example of two types of um, post-market surveillance activities that you perform on the effectiveness of risk controls that I see companies forget to do all the time. The hazard, the, the um, human factors risk controls and the software cybersecurity risk controls. But there would be other types too. Um, if you're going to do a clinical study and you're going to look at the effectiveness of a knee implant or hip implant, you're going to do that study for six months, maybe even a year, but you're not going to use it, do it for 20 years for a hip implant. You're going to do post-market surveillance on people that have the hip implant put in to see how long the hip implants last, see how quickly they recover. Another thing you're going to find is that you're going to have revision rates that differ from one surgeon to the next and one patient to the next. Not everybody, not every patient is well suited to every device. So you've got to have good patient selection by the physicians. And that's part of the training in the instructions that you provide. Um, also, their technique that they use, what tools you give them to do their job, all of that matters. So you should be looking at any implants with additional post-market surveillance 
um, of the risk controls and how well they're working. So those are three examples of post-market surveillance that you should be thinking of right off the top of the bat for any device that you're developing. To summarize, when you are developing any new device, yes, you have your design plan, but you need a risk management plan as well. The standard that you should use as state-of-the-art or best practice is ISO 14971. The current version of that standard is 2019. And there is a guidance document that you, yes, you have to buy that standard. It's a guidance document that explains how to use that standard and it gives you a bunch of additional supporting data that you need in the back of it in the annexes. And that's called ISO TR24971 and that's a 2020 standard. Now, if you're looking for additional resources, I put down below in the links, I put a, links for other YouTube videos that we've written on risk analysis and risk controls. Uh, Matthew did a great one on FMEA math. So if you're learning how to do a theory of modes and effects analysis, which is one type of risk analysis, we've got that. We've got links to training videos. We've got links to a procedure for risk management. So there's a lot of additional resources that you have hyperlinks for down below. But if you have any questions about risk management, please put comments down, down below. I'd be happy to answer them. It really gets the more engagement in this particular video. And if you have any suggestions for follow-up sessions um, that I could do on risk management or 14971, please let me know. We can do some more advanced stuff. But I wanted to cover just the basics. Of what is 14971 2019? And I wanted to explain what the different sections are, those 10 sections, and sort of give you a breakdown of how the process is supposed to work. I hope this was helpful to you. And if it was, please share it with everybody else. Thank you. Have a great day.